Hello, and thank you for joining us for tonight's event. My name is Bailey, and I'm an event host here at Powell's Books in Portland, Oregon. Before we begin, I want to encourage you to check out our lineup of upcoming virtual and in-person events by visiting our website at powells.com and clicking the events tab at the top of the page. Please remember to follow us on our various social media channels, such as Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Tonight, we're honored to welcome author Russell King in conversation with Walden Kirsch to discuss Russell's novel, Rajneesh Puram. In 1981, ambitious young Ma Anad Sheila transported the Indian guru Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh to the United States to fulfill his dream of creating a utopia for his thousands of disciples. Four years later, the incendiary Rajneesh Puram commune in Oregon collapsed under the weight of audacious criminal conspiracies hatched in its inner sanctum, including the largest bioterrorism attack in U.S. history, an unprecedented election fraud scheme, and multiple attempted murders. Drawing from extensive interviews with formal disciples and an exhaustive review of commune records, government and police files, and archival materials, author Russell King probes the charismatic power that Bhagwan, later known as OSHA, and Sheila exercised over the community and the turbulent legal and political environment that left common leaders ready to deceive, poison, and even murder to preserve their home and their master. Rajneesh Param is a fresh examination of the Rajneesh story and using newly available information and in interviews with high-ranking disciples who have never before shared their stories. Russell King is a writer, investigator, and attorney in 2018, he created the podcast Building Utopia, Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh, which explores the history of Bhagwan and his disciples using an immersive narrative nonfiction approach. He is joining us from Chicago, Illinois. Russell will be joined in conversation by Walden Kirsch. Walden is a lifelong reporter and photographer. He reported the news at KGW TV8 in Portland for 17 years and covered the rise and fall of the Rajneeshis in Oregon. He now reports on the technology industry for a big high-tech firm and has covered stories from across the US, Europe, Asia, Africa, and the Middle East. He is joining us from right here in Portland, Oregon. This evening's event will also include a Q&A. Please use the Q&A button located at the bottom of your screen if you'd like to ask a question at any time. If someone has already typed a question that you'd also like to know the answer to, please upvote that particular question. Perhaps most importantly, please support Russell and Powell's by purchasing a copy of Rajneesh Puram. Keep an eye out on the chat where I will be sharing links to purchase this book. Now let's give a warm virtual welcome to Russell King and Walden Kirsch. Thanks, Bailey. <laughs> so Russell, nice to see you. you know, although you and I have never actually met face to face, it feels like uh, we've been on the same crazy roller coaster ride of this just wild, crazy, unpredictable story. I, now, I was there covering it, of course, and you, as Bailey has said, did an, has done an amazing amount of really in-depth research interviews and archival stuff and so on. Um, you, I'm, I think you probably know more about the Rajneeshi economy and the rise and fall than probably any other person alive. So I'm curious, um, for folks who weren't in Oregon in the 80s or weren't alive in the 80s, take me back. Jay, well, what was this all about? <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Walden. If you'll indulge me for one second, I want to say thank you to Powell's for hosting us. I have been to Portland quite a bit. I have family in Oregon. I love Powell's. It's one of my favorite bookstores. So thank you for, for hosting me for this event and for supporting my book. And thank you to you, Walden, um, for agreeing to do this event. I'm so excited that I got to connect with you as part of this. Um, so uh, maybe we could talk more about kind of your experience uh, working for KGW down the road. But uh, yeah, thank you. Um, so yeah, so what was Rajneesh Purim? What was this topic? So really, um, Rajneesh Purim was a spiritual community in central Oregon, um, as probably many people on here know. And it was dedicated to a particular Indian guru, Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh, who rose to prominence in India in the 1960s. In the 1970s, he gained a worldwide following. Um, and he was very attractive to people um, who wanted to sort of get away from traditional ways of life. They wanted to drop their sort of expectations that were being placed on them and commit themselves to improving themselves, to, to moving forward along the path to enlightenment. Um, so they became his disciples. They formed an ashram in India first. And then in 1981, um, he uprooted his entire spiritual community and moved the center of it to America and specifically to Oregon. So, um, so my book is really tracing from the moment they get to America to the moment when they all left, um, especially Bhagwan and his secretary, Sheila. Um, so my book is Rajneesh Purim, focusing on the, that five-year period. 
you know, you touched on it right there also, but the dream when they arrived is really quite extraordinary. I mean, uh, the plans they had were really pretty, pretty amazing. You, you describe it in the book, the, 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 the gardens, the, uh, the farming, the lake, the, uh, they had a very grand plan, did they not? Yeah, they did. And I honestly, I think that's one of the most captivating parts of this history. And that's really what drew me in as somebody who's kind of one generation removed from these events. I was born in the 1980s, so I missed this as it was happening. I learned about it when Wild Wild Country came out on Netflix and just became fascinated by this topic. And I had to know more. And part of what inspired me to learn more and, and intrigued me was the, the scope of their ambitions and the audacity of it. Um, now, we certainly know that there were criminal things that happened toward the end of their time in, in, in Oregon and, and even before, um, but I think early on it was this idea that they were going to buy this huge chunk of land and not just put up a couple trailers and, you know, they weren't just going to go into Antelope and just, you know, buy a couple storefronts and, and build a little community there. They were going to build an entire city from the ground up and, and they really did it in a period of about one or two years. I mean, most of their construction happened over about a one year period. Um, so it's really remarkable what they were able to get done in that amount of time and sort of the, the scope of their ambition. Now, when we get into the criminal elements, you'll see that some of that ambition, unfortunately, carried over to their, uh, you know, not so legal schemes, but, um, but the construction was certainly a piece of that. And it was in a very remote area. I mean, for folks who know Oregon, the John Day River and so on, this is not Portland. This is not a major city. They picked a very remote area. It takes, I've driven there, of course, many times. It's a multiple hour drive from Portland over the Cascades and down through the uh, high desert country. They picked a, a very out of the way place to set up their, their uh, the, the commune. Yeah, they sure did. And you know, that's something, another thing that's interesting about this is, and, and questions that I've received since putting the book out there is, you know, why did people care so much? I mean, they really were in a, in a remote area where people couldn't even see what they were doing, frankly. I mean, it was 125 square miles. It was more than 80,000 acres. And the closest town was Antelope, which had a population of about 40. Um, so to, to see what they were actually doing on their commune, in their community, you really had to go looking for it. You had to, you had to drive down that county road, that winding, rutted county road, which I'm sure you drove many, many times, um, to, get, to get to the heart of the commune to see what they were actually doing. Um, but there was just a very intense interest in what they were doing. Why, why did they come here? Why did they buy this big chunk of land? Um, there was rumors about them being a sex cult who had been abusive to people in India. And so certainly there was a lot of public interest from the minute they set foot in Oregon. So let's pick up that thread in a second, but I think it might be worth asking based on the, the amazing dream that we know the Rajneeshis had, where did things start to run off the rails? When did things start to go south, Russell? Yeah, so my theory, and I sort of posit this in the book, is that Rajneesh Puram was doomed from the moment they decided to buy property in Oregon. I think they actually could have done a lot of what they intended to do if they had gone to, say, Wyoming or to states where there are places where you really can do a lot on a piece of remote property and, and not get a lot of government interference. Um, Oregon in 1981 had really the most rigorous, strict land use planning regime in the entire country um, and had been that way for, for years at that point. And so coming into Oregon, buying a piece of agricultural land and thinking we can do whatever we want on this was always a bad idea. It was never going to work. And um, so I think that's kind of <laughs> where things started to go wrong was when the decision was made to go to Oregon. And it seems like high level leaders of the commune knew that it was gonna be a dangerous place for them to go in terms of getting what they wanted to get done. Um, Sheila certainly knew that. Um, it sounds like Baguan probably knew that from some sources I spoke with. They knew that there was these challenges. They knew these laws would get in their way, but there was just this sort of sannyasin mentality that went back to Baguan himself that was, we can get it done. We'll get it done. Just, you know, don't, don't worry about it. And I think a lot of that came from uh, maybe spending a lot of time in India where things could get done if you kind of play things the right way. The interesting thing now that you mentioned, Russell, is that, and you talk about this in the book, um, is that uh, uh, Sheila was sent out sort of as, a, as an advanced team, if you will, from Pune, where the uh, ashram was originally established. And she looked all over the world for potential places to set up a commune. So it's interesting, based on what you said, that she or they happened to pick with probably the most unfriendly state in terms of land use laws that they that they might have. They might have gone to Wyoming or Montana, but so that was maybe an early 
strategic mistake they made, perhaps. Yeah, I think so. And and what I really enjoyed uh, researching this book was I got to talk to so many different people who had different perspectives. And I talked to a number of people who are still, they still consider them, themselves disciples or, or lovers of Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh or Osho as he's known today. And they often talk about Bhagwan in terms of mysteries or kind of puzzles that he would put forth to his disciples as something for them to solve or something that in the process of solving would sort of move them closer to enli enlightenment or, mm -hmm. or down their spiritual path. And so perhaps, I mean, as they would see it, the idea of buying this impossible piece of land where they would never get to do what they wanted to, you know, a, a true disciple could see that as one of Bhagwan's challenges, one of his um, Zen koans that he would give them, an unsolvable problem um, that he liked creating. It kind of created turmoil in their lives and, and provoked them to move forward along the path to enlightenment. You know, it's interesting. That raises a question in my mind, which I think you answer nicely in the book, and I have puzzled over, frankly, myself for many years, is what exactly was the appeal? I mean, he attracted people Bhagwan from all over the world. And at festival time, as you report in the book, by the thousands from all over the world. Um, talk a little bit about what it was that caused people of, from all walks of life, but especially the wealthy and the educated, to decide to give up everything, which many did, sign over their homes, their, their, their valuables. What caused, what was the, what was the magnetism that, that he had from based yeah, on your conversations? Yeah, so it's important to put this in the context of the 1970s, which is when he attracted most of his disciples. And it was a time when a lot of people were seeking something spiritual that, that was missing from their lives, particularly people in the West. And you see this with um, you know, the Beatles moving to India for a period of time in the 1960s and living with a guru. I mean, there was sort of a movement that you needed to find spiritual answers, you needed to find your guru, find your path. And you couldn't do that by working as an accountant in Dayton. You know, you, you needed to travel and, and expand your world. And so a lot of people were going to India in the 1970s and looking for someone who could help them move along that path and, and sort of discover themselves. And what was so appealing about Bhagwan is a, a couple things. One is that he spoke English um, and could communicate with them just kind of personally. Um, he also had an understanding of the Western world mm -hmm. and you know, the Western mind, you could call it. He really understood sort of the Western perspective. He read a ton. He read at least over 100,000 books, probably more than that, um, and remembered them very well. He could, he could recite them sometimes almost verbatim in his lectures. Um, so he really understood them when they came and sat at his feet. Um, and he was very permissive, which I think was also appealing to people who were trying to get out of maybe a, a, a rigid life or a marriage they didn't want to be in, um, children that they didn't really want to have in their lives anymore, um, you know, those oppressions that they were trying to escape. But Guan's attitude was, you can do whatever you want. Um, drop that stuff. If you don't like your family, drop your family. They're, they're holding you back. You don't need a career. You know, he, he kind of was very permissive. And I think that did appeal to a lot of people who suddenly realized, well, I don't have to live in London. I can come live in your ashram and dedicate myself to you and to my own spiritual growth and take group therapy classes and dance and make music and, and have sex with whoever I want to have sex with. I mean, that was sort of Bhagwan's permissive attitude. And um, that was very appealing to a number of people in the 1970s and 80s. You know, it's interesting. Let's uh, move a little bit ahead sort of chronologically. So you described, painted the picture of what the appeal was. Um, as everybody knows now, um, things went south pretty rapidly. Um, trace out for me what it was that sort of started the snowballing of the collapse of the commune. What what came unraveled? Why did that happen already? Yeah, it's, so, it's a, that's definitely something that I tried to untangle in my book. And I think when you read that or when you kind of read any history of it, you see that there was a lot of pressures on the commune from the outside, but also a lot of pressures from the inside. And it's hard to identify any one particular thing. I do think for example, like I said before, just buying that piece of property was sort of the beginning of the end because the moment they set foot in Oregon, they were in conflict with everyone around them. Um, another problem is that they were lying. The disciples were lying about what their intentions were in Oregon from the very beginning. Um, it was always supposed to be the new commune. This is something that Bhagwan had been talking about in India for years, that he wanted to build this very progressive, very experimental new commune. It was going to be his mystery school where master and disciples could be together, um, explore their spirituality, explore the great uh, mystics over time. 
Um, and, and Oregon was going to be it. The, the Rajneesh Purim was going to be it. But when they came to Oregon, they didn't say that. <laughs> they didn't say to the people of Wasco County, well, we're bringing thousands of people to live here. Um, they talked about a, a small farming community. That's what they were doing. And, and in fact, they didn't even say that Bhagwan was going to be living there at first. He was in New Jersey initially when they came to America. And um, so there was a lot of deception happening from the very beginning. And um, locals, I think, picked up on that pretty quickly. I think county officials picked up on that, state officials picked up on that. And so then it became a, a trust issue. And once you started having that, I, I really think that then snowballed. That's probably where the snowball started. And you know, obviously, uh, as Bailey pointed out, you're a lawyer, and this gets really legal really quickly. This mm -hmm. is a very complicated legal story, which you <laughs> untangle very nicely in the book. But um, there's a bunch of threads here, a whole bunch of threads that they were sort of fighting from a legal perspective as things became came unraveled. Can you kind of untangle that for us? Yeah, um, yeah, there are a lot. I mean, <laughs> I'm going to try to even know where to begin, but I think yeah. land use was like, we yeah. can kind of start with that. I mean, yeah. land use was always a conflict with them. Mm -hmm. And they kept, the, the disciples kept trying to find creative ways around those problems. And that was, again, came from Bhagwan himself. I mean, that was just his mentality was like, we can kind of bulldoze our way through problems. We can be creative. We don't need to be hindered by technicalities. And so, for example, their greatest idea that they had at the time was to incorporate their own city on their ranch property. Um, and that would allow them to control zoning. They would control the zoning board. They would have the city government, um, all disciples. And so it gave them the control that they needed, the autonomy to build the commune that they wanted to build that would fulfill Bhagwan's vision. Um, and so, but that led to legal entanglements. And, um, and that's part of what I track in the book is sort of what were they trying to do? How did they do it? And then what were the consequences? It's a cause and effect story mm -hmm. that gets you to the point where people are willing to consider poisoning and you know, poisoning entire community and murdering public officials. And I mean, those seem so just wild. And that was part of the mystery for me was how do you get to that point? And that really is by starting with some of these maybe mundane legal disputes like, like land use, where they're told you can build a city, and then a year later, they're told you can't build a city, and the laws are changing underneath them, and there's retroactive rules being put in place as the state starts pushing back. And um, so land use was certainly something that I tracked throughout the, the course of the book to try to understand what was happening and what was the impact inside the commune. Um, the other big legal issue besides criminal stuff would be, well, it's sort of criminal, is immigration-related issues. A big problem was that most of Bhagwan's disciples were from not America. Um, a lot of them came from Europe, um, Germany, England in particular, um, those two countries. Uh, Indian, he saw Indian disciples, people from Australia, but they all wanted to live in the center of his universe, which was going to be Oregon. So they had to find a way to be able to stay permanently in the United States. And so there began to be a manipulation of the uh, marriage laws, green card laws, to try to, to allow people to stay in the country long term. So that's another legal issue that I untangle as I go through the book. And that's without even getting to the, the crimes. Yeah, so actually, that's kind of where I want to go next is you kind of drove past it real quickly there. But uh, for people who are fre coming fresh to the story and don't know the, the full arc of the story, the kinds of things that happened as the legal um, environment got tighter and tighter, really quite extraordinary. I mean, we talk about poisoning of salad bars, we talk about attempted murders. There was a whole cadence, a whole sequence, a large number of highly criminal activities that were going on as the legal situation became more intense. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. I, you can trace a lot of those criminal events that happened toward the end of the commune to sort of non-criminal events that happened earlier on, just antagonism, pushback. And one thing that I, I explored in my book that I, I thought it was important to, to make part of the story was the violence directed toward disciples early on when they came to Oregon. I think often the story is about guns. And even today, people think that the moment the disciples arrived in Oregon, they had you know, Uzis. And that's not true. The Uzis came later. Mm -hmm. And there were things that led up to the fact that they felt they needed to have this protection on, on the ranch and thought mm -hmm. that'd be a good idea. Um, and when you look at records, for example, from Governor Atia's office from 1982, one year into their time here in Oregon, you can see public officials and federal officials making sort of panicked phone calls to the governor's office saying, I was just at a meeting in the Dalles, and I think there's going to be violence directed toward 
disciples unless you do something, unless you intervene in some way. Um, people from Moscow County were showing up with bullets around their necks. Um, you know, Baguan had somebody shoot toward his convoy at one point. Somebody flashed a gun at Sheila on a street. Um, and, you know, some the disciples sometimes would manufacture some of these events to kind of gain some um, empathy from people. But these were public officials who saw these with their own eyes. They saw these threats. They heard these threats. And they were very concerned about the violent conditions and that's before the disciples had, you know, Uzis on and were doing the public weapons training in 1985 and um, before all the wiretapping had happened. I mean, this was very early on. Um, so I'm certainly not absolving the sannyasins of some of their antics early on when they first came in terms of lying to people and sort of manipulating the laws to get what they wanted um, in certain cases. But I also think it's important to look at the flip side of that, which is that in reaction to some of that, they were getting a lot of antagonism from, from people in the community outside of, uh, outside of the commune. So um, that's an important part of the story. You know, um, in reading the book carefully, I was surprised, frankly, by some of the things which you found out, dug up, reported based on your conversations. One of the questions coming in is, well, what's new? And I'll be candid. A lot of stuff to me was new, having known the story as well as it and having read the book. I mean, just for example, multiple murder attempts on a gentleman named Devaraj, Devaraj who was the Bhagwan's physician. Um, I didn't know, maybe other folks did, that the Bhagwan, for all of his love of people, was virulently anti-gay. Um, uh, I didn't know that, for example, Governor Tia, who just mentioned, as things were getting very tense, I uh, was considering declaring martial law, which is an extraordinary step for government to take. So um, you and your archival work and interviews kind of picked up a bunch of rocks and uncovered a, a bunch of uh, threads of the story, which I hadn't, I suspect others have not been uh, fully, fu fully aware of. Yeah, that was important to me. I wanted to bring something fresh to this. There's no reason to write a book that just rehashes what was known 20 years ago. And, and part of my impetus for writing the book was that there hasn't been a, a fresh telling of this in, in literary form, um, in a book form for a very long time, perhaps decades. Um, and so I really wanted to dig into that. I wanted to mine through the records. I wanted to look at the criminal investigative files. I got access to some records in the Oregon State Archives that I think probably have not seen the light of day until, until I looked at them, because I know I had to really <laughs> push to get those records. Um, and, and I interviewed a lot of disciples who, um, who had not publicly shared their stories before. And that was important to me. I wanted to learn more. And I wanted to be able to answer some questions that to my satisfaction had not been answered. But the biggest one for me always was what was going on inside the commune that led to sort of the big marquee events that everybody seems to think about when they think about sannyasins, they think about salmonella and all that kind of stuff. But that's, I knew that wasn't the whole story. I knew that there was a sequence of events that got to that point. And that was my goal was unpacking that, understanding the tensions within the community, within the kind of the leadership hierarchy, um, but also looking at the political tensions and legal tensions and kind of tracing the lawsuits and the cause and effect there, like I was saying. You know, I'm curious as a longtime reporter, I'm always interested in other investigators secret sauces, if you will. This is a very, very emotionally charged story, as you know, as I know. I'm curious, um, one of our listeners is wondering about whether you interviewed Phil Tokes, who I believe is Naren, if I'm not mistaken. How did you um, approach and how did you um, communicate to the people you were talking with that um, you were somebody to be trusted? Because uh, there's a great deal of mistrust, even after all these years. How did you um, arrange to have conversations that were meaningful and produced helpful new information? Russell. Yeah, that's a great question and something that was really important to me because I wanted to establish trust with the people I was speaking with. I wanted them to know that I wasn't you know, out to write a, a hit piece about the crazy sex cult that you know, <laughs> descended upon Oregon and just did all these horrible things. I really wanted to come from a place of understanding and empathy. And that's, that's I hope that's conveyed in the book as well. Um, and so really it was a matter of sort of getting my foot in the door with a couple people who had listened to my podcast series. I, I did a podcast about this topic um, called Building Utopia, Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh. Um, and some disciples, former disciples who had lived at the commune listened to that. And I think they kind of resonated with the way that I was digging into it in an empathetic, but hopefully unflinching way. Um, and they reached out to me, I reached out to them and we kind of connected with each other. And once I built trust with a small group of people, 
as much cold calling as I did. And I did a lot. <laughs> I sent out a lot of Facebook messages. I kind of hunted down names based on old FBI records. And, you know, I really scoured to get as many people as I could to talk to me. But at the end of the day, the best sources that I got were people that had been sort of passed along to me by somebody with whom I'd already established a connection. And um, yeah, and so that helped. I think it was just being credible with them, being trustworthy and, and really listening. I, I spent a long time with a lot of disciples just listening, not mm -hmm. even asking as many questions as I might have wanted in every call, but just trying to hear their perspective of these events. And this was right after Wild Wild Country came out. And so mm -hmm. right. there were all these stories coming out and people sort of thought that the story was being spun in a particular way. And mm -hmm. um, I was kind of another chance for them to offer up their perspective on this. Would my guess be correct? Because I've certainly been in this position in my, in my career that at some point people who have been in a particularly pressure cooker situation maybe even want to unburden themselves describe what was happening now that perhaps the dust has settled. Is that part of the dynamic when you're talking to sannyasins, ex-sannyasins? I think that's absolutely right. I think uh, some people, I won't call it therapy, but I think some of the sources I spoke with saw this as a way to reflect. It was almost a prompt for them to reflect on events by talking about it out loud in a way that they hadn't really re reflected on it in 40 years almost um, since leaving the community. Um, and so, and it helped that I kind of, I could prompt them with dates and names and I kind of knew the facts and that kind of helped move things along and kind of put them in the right frame of mind um, about the details. But yeah, I think that, I think that is true. I think people wanted to do some soul searching. Some of my sources did for sure. Um, and, you know, I think people who were involved in some of the more criminal, especially the, the murder type plots, they don't want to talk about that stuff. Um, but there were some other pieces of the story, like, for example, wiretapping was a big part of the, the criminal charges that came out of the fall of Rajneesh Puram. And um, I found one source who was directly involved in the wiretapping. He was kind of the mastermind who created all the technology um, and helped to install a lot of it, a lot of the eavesdropping equipment and the wiretapping equipment. Um, and, you know, I don't think anyone had ever really asked him about that. And he sort of was like surprised, but also sort of delighted, like, <laughs> yes, I did this and, you know, not proud of it. He knows that what he did was wrong, but, um, you know, I think it's just a chance for him to kind of explain what happened. And he certainly had some guilt and some remorse about it, but um, yeah, it kind of gave him a chance to talk through that and share it with an outsider, um, which, yeah, was great. To me, one of the most remarkable interviews you had was with the young man, well, he was a child at, at, the, at the commune, and you yeah. spoke with him as an adult. Dick and Clark is his name, as I recall? Dick and, Dick and Kent, yeah. Dick and Kent, I'm sorry. Um, that was an amazing story. And uh, that was, I think, a thread in the book, which was completely new to me, that um, how children were treated, or frankly, not treated, or used, or frankly, abused at the ranch. Um, and that, that conversation you had with him was, to me, was really eye-opening. Yeah, that, it was an important part of this history that I wanted to make sure was included because I think it's been a bit overlooked. Um, not to say no one's talked about it, but it, it had been pretty quiet. Um, and it's something that, I mean, with most things that happened in terms of the crimes at Rajneesh Puram, most disciples did not know that they were happening. They might have had some suspicions, but most of the kind of notorious crimes that we know about there were plotted among a very small group of people among the thousands of people that were living there. Um, and that's really important to note. It's not like a den of thousands of criminals living there. There was kind of a, a small coterie of people that were masterminding a lot of those things. And then a lot of people that were oblivious. Um, but yeah, so it was important for me to look at this though, because it's an example of something that was happening at the commune. And it sounds like most people knew about it, but did nothing to stop it. And that's the sexual abuse of children at the ranch. And it really gets back to Bhagwan's philosophy about children in general. He sort of had a hands-off approach to children. He thought that nuclear families were dead. It was a dead institution. There was no reason for marriages, frankly. Um, and there's certainly no reason for a husband and a wife and children to live together in one home. Um, and he talked about this while he was still in India, that at the new commune, his vision was to have no more nuclear families and children would be raised by everybody in the community. Um, and they would not be bonded to just their parents, they would be bonded to multiple adults who could teach them different things. And it would be a way to kind of free up the children to, to learn from a lot of different people, which you know, in some ways might sound noble on its face, but once it was played in practice, put, it, put into practice in Oregon, um, there were a lot of really bad results. I mean, parents would come to the commune to live there with their children, and they'd be immediately separated from their kids. Their kids would be sent to live together in a bunkhouse. 
um, or into trailers with other adults who they didn't know, and their parents would be sent off to live somewhere else. And that was just the way it was going to be, and, and everyone had to kind of go along with that. You know, it's interesting. I went out there I was dozens and dozens of times in the early <clears throat> mid-80s, and candidly, um, Russell, I never saw any children. They must have been, as you report in the book, segregated, if you will, shunted aside, put in bunkhouses, because um, that was, as you say, what the Bhagwan wanted. He didn't want children kind of in the way, if you will. Um, yeah, children could kind of hinder your progress towards your own enlightenment. It could be a distraction. He talked about that in India, that um, ideally there wouldn't be kids in his communities, but obviously people were going to have babies and, you know, unless people were all sterilized, which is something that he did advocate, um, then there were going to be kids and we had to find something to do with them. And the answer was to, yeah, kind of shunt them away. Um, and, you know, they were part of the community in that they got jobs um, from age five onwards. All kids at the, at the commune had to work. Um, but later on, um, toward the end of the commune, a lot of kids were sent to live in Antelope. And so their right. parents were 20 miles away, you know, 40 minute hour long drive on this awful county road in, in Rajneeshpuram. Well, their kids were living in an entirely different town um, with other kids and overseen by kind of a rotating cast of, of parents who sort of volunteered or were given this task to, to be a temporary surrogate parent. Um, so yeah, it was a, a tough situation. And, um, you know, the kids didn't get a vote about it. <laughs> they were brought to the commune and this is kind of what they, how they had to live. Um, and part of this hands-off approach led to adults having sex with children, sexually abusing children. Um, and it became something that was prevalent enough that people knew that it was happening. Um, and- uh, Actually, I'd pause you, I'd pause there. I, it may have been known on the ranch, but as a reporter who covered the story closely, I candidly had never heard those those allegations. We all, I think, had heard that back in Pune or in Europe, there were these uh, strange, crazy, orgy type uh, activities. Yeah. But when I was covering the story, I certainly had been, had not been aware of any allegations. But to me, it was a new a new thread uh, a new thread in the book. Also. Yeah, that's a great clarification. And yeah, people on the commune, it sounds like generally were aware that this were happening. Maybe not yeah. everybody, but it sounds like a lot of people were aware that this was going on. Um, but again, it got back to Bhagwan's mentality of kind of hands off, don't interfere in other people's business. If you see something happening that you think is bad, don't interfere because you don't know if it's bad or good. This is something that he talked about when he was in India in a, in a lecture that kind of gives me shivers when I read it. He talked about um, uh, sexual assault, about rape. And he said, if you see a woman getting raped, don't interfere because you don't know why she's getting raped. Um, you know, maybe she wants it. I mean, just kind of things that make you cringe like that. And so you can kind of see how that mentality would transfer to Oregon. Um, I did talk to a number of disciples there who I could have very rational conversations with about a lot of topics. But when it came to this, and when I really pressed them on, why didn't anyone do anything? I mean, you know, these were kids. Why didn't anybody try to stop this? you know, the excuses for an outsider don't really add up. I think it gets back to sort of the mentality of the group at the time of Bhagwan, and they can kind of say, we sort of delegated that to the leaders of the commune. Like they kind of set the rules and we weren't there to challenge that. Um, but for me as an outsider looking at this, it's unsatisfactory for me. So that's why I wanted to make sure I talked about it in the book too. So people can kind of see that as part of this history. One thing you mentioned a moment ago, I'd like to circle back on Russell. And, and I think it's an important point um, that um, the commune, the ranch, was run by a very small, very powerful coterie, mostly women, and by and large, except for this, this, uh, this very tiny stratum at the top of the commune, most of the other, uh, the vast majority of the followers, sannyasins, um, were really unaware of the kinds of um, activities and uh, illegalities and crimes that were unfolding as the, as the commune collapsed. In fact, I remember personally being there and seeing uh, after, at the, as the commune was collapsing, hundreds of, of Rajneeshis crying, sobbing. They had no idea, and I, they truly didn't have any idea what was going on essentially in, in, in front of them. Yeah, yeah, I think that's true. And that's something that I wanted to keep prodding when I was doing my research on this is, is it possible that so many of these just heinous crimes were taking place and people really didn't know about it. And, um, and you can look at all of the FBI interviews and the police reports that came out of the immediate investigation after the kind of the beginning of the end of the commune. 
And you can see a lot of people saying like, you know, I saw suspicious things happening. I saw people, you know, sannyasins wearing disguises, leaving the commune, or, you know, I saw people kind of hiding away in this one particular back building and only certain people got access, but nobody really knew why. I mean, so they had suspicions, but I don't think they imagined that there were actual crimes being plotted by some of the commune leadership, um, and certainly not the types of crimes that were being plotted. But it seems like the one in, in reading interviews and talking to people, the, the crimes that seemed to be the most shocking to disciples was the plots to try to kill people within the community itself. Um, mm -hmm. There was no question there was antagonism of people on the outside, not that that would excuse any harm to them. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the idea that disciples were within the custody care and control of, you know, of the commune leaders, but they would, you know, intentionally sicken them or try to jab them with something to stop their heart from beating. Repeatedly, repeatedly. Yeah, repeatedly, cases. you know, and if one failed, try again the next day or try again the next year or, you know, pumping gas into somebody's trailer while they slept. I mean, there was all these ideas that were either at least discussed or in some cases even attempted. Um, and that seemed to really shock people that um, that leaders of their own community would try to harm fellow disciples. That seemed to really have a, a, a psychic impact on people there. One of the other aspects that I think you touched on as we were talking a moment ago, and one of the folks in, uh, in the event is asking, um, I was surprised until you reported it in the book how um, virulently anti-gay the Bhagwan was, given that he was ostensibly a loving, inclusive, peaceful, yeah sort of individual, his, his writings and his, and his uh, some of his speech was very, very hateful in regard to, to gays, gay people. They were, and honestly, it was surprising to me too, as an outsider looking at this, <clears throat> excuse me, which is he really thought that gay people were less than human and something he said repeatedly. Um, and that goes all the way back to India where he talked about that as, as homosexuality is being less than. He often talked about it being sort of a perversion that came out of the church, out of the Catholic church or out of other religions. And that's often how he sort of shoehorned it into conversation. Um, but then the AIDS crisis happened and it became a, sort of an obsession for him. AIDS did, it's something that the commune had very stringent um, AIDS prevention protocols in place. People had to wear gloves and mm -hmm. condom use was, was required. And, um, you know, there's a lot of things in place about AIDS, but he also used it once he started speaking again in 1984 as a, a vehicle to talk again about how homosexuality was this degraded, degraded state. It was a perversion and his disciples had to drop it. They had to go to being heterosexual if they expected to stay in his community. Um, mm -hmm. And what's interesting is he particularly started saying that after Sheila left, and Sheila sort of famously surrounded herself with a lot of gay men. Um, I think she enjoyed their company um, from talking to her, interviewing her. She seemed to just enjoy the company of gay men. She actually married a gay man. Mm -hmm. um, and so she clearly did not have the same concerns that Bhagwan did. Um, but it's almost like, I think in some ways, gay people became a, a proxy for Sheila. And he just started launching broadsides against um, gay people and against homosexuality after mm -hmm. Sheila left. It's, it's kind of hard to read those, those lectures. Now, you just mentioned something in passing we probably shouldn't uh, skip over. It's rather remarkable to think back on it, but there was a protracted period of time after the Bhagwan arrived here when he didn't speak. He was silent. And then yeah. when he broke his silence, that was huge news worldwide for followers, right? <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. He fell into silence just within months before he left India and came to America. And it's something that I talked to Sheila about when I interviewed her, because there's been a lot of theories about why that happened. And, and Sheila confirmed something that I heard from other sources, which is that Bhagwan didn't want to mess with any of the very delicate plans they had to move Bhagwan out of the country. Mm -hmm. um, and so according to Sheila, at least, she, you know, he made the choice that he's not going to interfere. So he's going to stop talking because whenever he spoke at his, at his public lectures in India, it would gain all this media attention. He'd be just castigating Mahatma Gandhi or the, you know, the prime minister or local politicians and, you know, just kind of always creating these little controversies everywhere he went. Um, so he fell into complete silence, which um, he had been warning his disciples might happen at some point. He said in the new commune, I'm not going to speak anymore because we're going to speak heart to heart. And by that point, our relationship, disciple and master will be so close that we don't really need that. Um, but so he, so he did that right before coming to America and kept it up for a number of years. 
But then in 1984, um, he grabbed his mic again and started giving daily lectures, first to a very intimate group of people that would be rebroadcast the next night. Um, and then he started doing them again in his large meditation hall to all of his disciples. And those were major events. I mean, you, you reported them. I was there. I asked Bhagwan many questions. I'll have to tell you personally, it was the strangest, one of the strangest experiences <laughs> I've ever had going to a nominally news conference with multiple thousands of people behind you cheering or booing as you asked a question. These were remarkable uh, events in Rajneesh Mandir, the very large hall you, you mentioned right there, Russell. Well, what you just talked about is, Walden, one of the reasons that I first wanted to talk to you because I, I watched so much archival video getting ready, you know, preparing for my book um, from the state or uh, the historical society, the historical society records. And um, I saw you on the on the commune all the time, asking Sheila hard questions, asking Boguan very hard questions, and asking local politicians and, and local officials tough questions also. Um, but I saw one of those interviews where it was after Sheila had left, Boguan was giving these big public press conferences in Rajneesh Mandir, which was this huge meditation hall. Um, yeah, and he organized it sort of like this event where there would be thousands of disciples sitting behind you on the floor, the reporter would have to be standing with them at, <laughs> at his back. And then Bhagwan is up on this dais, like a god, like a king, um, you know, answering questions from the petitioners who came to, to throw- Very uncomfortable. That. Trust yeah. me, very uncomfortable. <laughs> I, that, yeah, and so that's, you know, I was, I was fascinated to talk to you for that reason, because I thought, what is that like? That's not normal. Not nice. <laughs> You know, you mentioned one thing here, the last little, another thread like, I'd like to pick up. We haven't talked about this yet. You referenced Bhagwan up on a dais, but he lived uh, in an extraordinarily comfortable fashion. We've all heard the stories about the Rolls Royces, but he had, a, he had a bubble around him that was very impenetrable. You couldn't, if you were an ordinary follower, you couldn't just go and interact with the Bhagwan, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. He really did. And, and it had been that way since his ashram back in India. Um, back in the early 70s, he, he worked out of an apartment in Mumbai, and disciples had a very direct connection to him. They could walk in, they could talk to his secretary, and she would show them into essentially his bedroom, and he'd be sitting in an easy chair, they could sit at his feet, and they talk about life, he'd ask them, you know, how are your travels, what's your family life like, I mean, he made a very personal connection, and that's when he brought in a lot of Western disciples, so it was just by making that sort of human personal connection with them. But over time, he became more removed from his disciples. And that started when he moved to his ashram in, in Pune, India. Um, he lived in a separate house from most of his disciples. It was walled off with a gate. Um, they could see him at certain times, but it was always in a group. He stopped doing individual appearances um, in most cases. It was, it was always in a group, always with an audience there to sort of laugh at his jokes and cheer him on and <laughs> witness the proceedings to make music. Um, and that continued in Oregon. He, basically didn't see anybody for uh, probably the first, probably two years that they were here. He would dri do his drive-bys. He might show up at maybe his birthday celebration and, and appear on the stage, but he wasn't speaking. So he wasn't really communicating with, with his, his disciples until he reclaimed his microphone in 1984 and began giving discourses again. Talk about the drive-bys. Those, those are remarkable uh, events. Uh, I went to a number of them. <laughs> So what, what was that all about? Yeah, it, it sounds like it, it happened organically, but Guan mm -hmm. really enjoyed driving. He, he stopped <laughs> driving for a long time in India. And then as soon as he got to New Jersey, when he was temporarily holed up at a castle in New Jersey, he wanted to drive and, and they had Rolls Royces at his disposal. He really liked them. And so he'd go shooting down the Garden State Parkway. And, and I heard he got a, a ticket once. A, <laughs> you know, know a, that. Yeah, a speeding ticket. Um, but he really liked driving. And I, I suspect, I don't know this, but I suspect it was a chance for him to get out of his bubble a little mm. bit. I mean, he really was, he lived in a compound of trailers up on a hill at Rajneesh Puram that was separated from everybody else again. No one could just kind of waltz up there and see him. Electric fence around it and only very certain people could live there or even visit that, that compound. Um, and so I think, especially in this period of silence, driving was just a chance for him to non-verbally just get out and sort of be among his people. It, it started with him just driving to some local towns, maybe Madras, mm -hmm. um, and coming back again on the, on the, on the county highways. Mm -hmm. But over time, people started realizing that Bhagwan was driving at a certain time every day. And so informally, people just sort of gathered along the road and mm -hmm. eventually it turned into a formal thing at a certain time. And um, as I'm sure you saw, towards the end of the commune, it became almost like a militarized yes. event as things were getting very heated with 
people on the outside as they were doing all this guns demonstrations, guns training. There was a helicopter that'd be hovering over the convoy, people with guns kind of hanging out of the helicopters. I mean, yep. it was a security event also, uh, you know, high, high risk security event that they monitored very closely because really it's the closest that people could get to Baguan um, while he was in Oregon. You know, you alluded to that, and I think you and I have talked about previously that um, as things became tenser and tenser, the amount of weaponry wasn't, wasn't just uh, the Russian police force up in the helicopter with automatic weapons pointed at the ground, but they were, they were building up their, their, uh, their, their weaponry and they were engaging, as you already, I think, mentioned in target practice. And they were very, very serious about uh, confronting the threats that they perceived with, uh, with deadly, deadly force, right? Yeah, th that's true. They would hold very public demonstrations. And, and sometimes it was in response to um, comments made by like the sheriff, the Wasco mm -hmm. County Sheriff mm -hmm. or the DA, mm -hmm you know, expressing concerns about sort of all these guns and these untrained people there. And so the response to that was, okay, we're going to have these these kind of show trainings where the, the press will all get called out here to the ranch. We can watch us, you know, on the, on the range and see our accuracy and see we've got this Israeli commando who's barking orders at us. And um, yeah, part of it was to, sh to sort of convey to the public, to the people of Oregon, that we're a serious seriously armed place. And mm -hmm. if you come in here, you're coming at your own peril. Um, and you can see that in, in statements that Sheila was making at the time too, about how, you know, we'll you know, take one of our heads, we'll take 10 of your heads or 15 of your heads. I mean, she, you know, she was making very inflammatory statements about um, returning violence for violence. And that was just sort of the, given the inflammatory nature of things at the time, it was just a, a very tense period in Oregon. And, and as that was unfolding, and one of our attendees is asking about this, um, you couldn't just walk freely around the commune. Uh, you talk about Isabel, and they, we call them the Twinkies. I don't recall if that comes up in the book, but yeah. the, it was a very, very um, controlled uh, media environment. Um, the strangers, or I shouldn't say strangers, but visitors had to check in, had to leave their vehicles. Um, it was a, a very, um, uh, very controlled environment. Rajneesh didn't want people, and for good reason, I should say, uh, simply walking around um, the commune unescorted, right? Yeah, and one incident that I talk about led to a lot of changes in security at the commune, and that has to do with the hotel bombing right. um, that happened in 1983. In the summer of 1983, the Hotel Rajneesh, which was in downtown Portland. 11th um, and Main Hotel Washington, uh, Hotel Martha Washington today. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Let me know the address. I was worried yeah, yeah. <laughs> I get asked that. I don't know the address, but I actually <laughs> visited it when I was doing yeah. my research. Um, but yeah, the, the, the hotel was firebombed. Um, and in my research, I, I found out that the, the person who did the bombing had been at the commune earlier that day mm -hmm. and had, in fact, spent the night at the commune the night before. Mm -hmm. And it was at a time when the commune was beginning to welcome outsiders to stay there for a period of time other than just for an hour-long tour. Um, they started having sort of resort facilities, meditation facilities, where people could sign up, pay money. They could stay in kind of these A-frame cabins that they had up in the canyons, or they could get a tent and you know, pitch a tent somewhere. Um, and then do meditation courses and things like that while they were at the commune. This was a new initiative there to sort of bring people from outside into the commune and show them, you know, maybe they weren't so scary. Um, but that sort of backfired. Bringing people into their community was a risk. And that's made apparent by this fire bomber who, with two associates, visited the commune the day before. We don't know if they had bombs with them at the time that they came to the commune, but they certainly had some duffel bags that they were sort of constantly shuffling around with them as they moved about the commune. Um, and they didn't exactly have free reign, but they, they really did a lot of wandering. Um, they wandered late into the night. They were walking along the county roads. A lot of disciples saw them. The, the Peace Force officer stopped at one point to see what they were doing. And, um, you know, they had probably more free reign than would ever happen ever again after that, because then the very next day after they left the commune, they didn't plant bombs there for reasons unknown, um, but they traveled directly to Portland. Um, Stephen Paul Pastor went up to, uh, to one of the rooms on the fourth story um, and planted three fire bombs that went off later that night. Um, so immediately after that, the security and, and surveillance apparatus descended upon Rajneesh Kurman. It became much more difficult for anybody on the outside um, to just kind of wander freely about the place. There was a spy system that was created. People were surveilled. Um, microphones were put into hotel rooms um, so people could be bugged having private conversations. And then the phones were tapped. And a lot of that gets back to the fact that these um, attackers had walked among them just you know days earlier. 
You know, you mentioned the bombing of the uh, Hotel Rajneesh, now the Martha Washington Hotel. I was very surprised. This is something which I, I, I uh, <laughs> learned from the book, among many other things, that the um, gentleman who did that bombing is still in the bomb making business. Yeah, as of until at least recently, he, um, he was affiliated with a radical Islamist group based out of Pakistan. Um, and he was known to be affiliated with them at the time, um, back in you know, the 1980s when this happened. They never really got to the motive for why he wanted to attack the Rajneeshis in particular or why he firebombed the hotel. There was a lot of speculation and there was kind of psychologists giving competing testimony at his trial. But, um, but you know, he was a, a radical Islamist. He's part of this group. Um, and uh, he ended up serving some jail time, not very much, getting out of jail and then traveling to Pakistan where he conducted training of, of uh, how to create bombs um, for people in this group. One of the questions come in, a number of folks very likely have seen the Wire of Wild Country documentary Netflix that you referred to. Curious after your research, Russell, um, what surprised you most in your work after uh, relative to what the Wild Wild Country documentarians uh, reported uh, on, on the rise and fall of the ranch? Yeah, it's a really good question. First off, I loved Wild Wild Country and I, had, I think it was a fantastic docu-series. I did a good job of sort of telling balancing perspectives. Yeah. And, and for my book, I intentionally decided to focus on inside the community. Um, and so the surprises for me along the way were sort of the connective tissue. And that's what I was most interested by. So I probably don't have one great like sparkling answer of like, aha, I found this thing that no one knew. But along the way, I kept kind of piecing things together where I kind of look at dates coinciding or there'd be a big court hearing on this day and then a kind of inflammatory public statement made two days before it. And you can kind of start piecing the trajectory together a little bit more. So those were kind of the happy surprises that I learned mm -hmm. along the way um, was just sort of like cause and effect. Um, so that was really important to me, I think. And then, yeah, I don't, other than that, I think, you know, yeah, I don't know. I just, I think that was kind of it. I think it was just kind of piecing together what all was going on. I did get some great interviews with people that I thought would never talk to me. Um, and a lot of them are named in the book. Um, but then there's a lot of people too that wanted to be anonymous and not share their, their full story. Um, and some of them confirmed things that had just been rumors before, but I got enough corroboration that I felt comfortable sharing their stories and talking about what happened to them in the book. So, you know, people having sexual encounters with Bhagwan himself, um, especially when he was in Mumbai. I talk about that quite a bit. Um, and then, yeah, I think the the child sexual abuse was another piece that was surprising the extent of it and how well known it was. And so I spent a lot of time trying to understand that because that did surprise me so much how sort of prevalent it was. One of the interesting questions has come in. I haven't frankly asked myself this question, but it's worth raising is, um, could something like this happen again? Where, what, what lessons do you think were learned collectively here in Oregon that would that would either allow or perhaps not allow something like this to, to, to happen again? Yeah, you know, part of me wants to say it's a once in a, and not even a lifetime, maybe once in many lifetime yeah. <laughs> event because yeah. it was this pairing yeah. of this really one of a kind guru who had yeah. so much charisma and so much power over his disciples paired with Sheila, who was a really get it done kind of person who mm -hmm. didn't ask a lot of questions. She wasn't particularly educated, but she was just kind of a, a fighter and she could kind of get things done. And she was completely devoted to Bhagwan and, and really wanted to fulfill his vision, especially early on. Um, and so when you have that pairing, that's kind of a unique pairing, I think. I mean, not unique in history, but they were so, um, capable, they got so much done and they worked well together despite how horrible things went, they could kind of, she could fulfill his vision and that's what led to so many, um, I think, horrible things happening. Um, but I think one lesson that I took away from it in talking to disciples was learning more about the idea of surrender. That was a big part of being a sannyasin. Um, it was sort of his tenpole pledge early on was that if you surrender to me as your guru, I will transform you. Mm -hmm. And I talked to a lot of disciples about what does surrender mean, and everybody understood it in a different way, sometimes slightly, but sometimes very different. Um, some people felt they were really literally surrendering to Bhagwan, that he was now in charge, they were going to do what he said, 
he would set the rules and they were just there to be a vessel and to be sort of molded by him. Mm -hmm. And you can kind of see that in, in the requirements of becoming a sannyasin. You mm -hmm. had to change your name yep. to a name that he gave you. You had to wear yeah, his picture wear, around wear your mala, neck. Right? Yeah, the mala necklace. You had to wear colors that he told you. You had to wear these sunrise mm -hmm. colors. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, if you were living in his community, you were abiding by his rules and the rules of the people underneath him. So mm -hmm you really were sort of surrendering your life to him in a way. But other people were a little more sort of skeptical of that. And they said, we weren't surrendering like zombies to him. We were just surrendering our egos to a, a master who could then help us along the path to enlightenment. But it wasn't surrendering to the man or to the guru. It was just sort of surrendering our egos. So people had different conceptions, but that to me is dangerous. I think it's dangerous that so many people were part of this thing and had this important sort of obligation to Bhagwan, but there wasn't a lot of agreement about what it meant. And once you surrender to another person, I think you're giving up a lot of power and becoming vulnerable. Um, so and on, on that score, and I'm not going to stray too deeply into politics, but any lessons, not just for Oregon, but for our greater American political system for <laughs> surrender to highly charismatic <laughs> Yeah, individuals. in my interviews, I had a lot of people make analogies to certain political leaders along the way. Um, you know, Sheila is like so-and-so and Bhagwan -so, is like so-and-so. -so, mm -hmm. and, and even frankly, at the time, there were always Hitler comparisons being thrown around. Mm -hmm. that, right. You know, at the commune, they would talk about the attorney general, Fronmeier, mm -hmm. as being a Nazi, you know, in the way right. that he was treating the sannyasins. And right. at the same time, you know, there's disciples who report hearing a tape of Bhagwan sort of lauding Hitler and saying good things mm -hmm. about Hitler as a yeah, leader. Yeah. So um, there's certainly, you know, some authoritarian elements going on at the commune itself. So I'm sure you can take all of those things and apply them to, a, to our modern world. Uh, uh, I don't you know, know if I'm qualified. <laughs> time is uh, taken down, but I did want to didn't want to close here without at least talking a little bit about Sheila, because after the Bhagwan, mm -hmm. Sheila, not Manan Sheila, was the almost universally known individual. You obviously talked with her. Yeah. What, what what was she like? Sheila, like. <laughs> she, Sheila was a trip. I mean, what's so interesting about Sheila is that she will talk to almost anybody who reaches mm -hmm. out to her. She does mm -hmm. podcasts, she does interviews, she did Wild Wild Country. She's in multiple documentaries, even before Wild Wild Country. So mm -hmm. she really wants, I mean, this is kind of just how she is. She likes a platform. She likes, you know, talking. She likes, she wants to get her, her framing of the story out there. That's really important to her. Um, so I was happy she said yes, but I also didn't put a ton of stock into it because mm -hmm. she's definitely got a set of, of, she's got a narrative set in her head that when you look at the facts, when mm -hmm. you even look at the crimes that she pled guilty to, her version doesn't always line up with sort of what was objectively going on. So um, it was interesting talking to her. You kind of get enraptured in some of her stories and then realize like oh, that, I don't think that's actually, yeah. So, but she's a very charismatic person, fascinating to talk to and very, you know, to me, she was very kind. She kept giving me additional interviews when I asked yeah. her more times, even after I asked her some hard questions. So yeah. um, I appreciate that she was willing to at least engage with me, which is yeah. more than a lot I enjoyed talking with her. It was never, it was never a uh, yeah. never problem getting a hold of her. Somebody here asking, um, see, Jane Stork was Shanti Badra, as I recall. And what happened to Shanti B? Do you know? Russell? Yeah, so she's featured in Wild Wild Country. If you yeah. remember in Wild Wild Country, there's a, a woman who is Australian. Yes. She has a very soft-spoken accent. I think she's wearing a turtleneck. She talks about cleaning toilets and then rising mm -hmm. up the ranks within Sheila's inner circle. Mm -hmm. um, so she ultimately did get, um, she was one of the, the people that was convicted of some crimes. She, mm -hmm. Sheila, and the nurse Pooja um, mm -hmm. were um, kind of the trio that first got arrested in Europe, extradited to America, um, and then they struck plea deals and served some time. So she did serve some time. She got released. She's now living abroad. Um, I believe she's in Europe and she's just kind of returned to a quiet life. She wrote a really beautiful memoir that I suggest called mm. Breaking the Spell. Um, mm. So after you read my book, I suggest you read Shanti's <laughs> book. Um, another, book I, another book I just want to shout out is called Promise of Paradise by Satya Bharti, another really beautiful mm. sannyasa memoir that uh, was helpful to me quite a bit. Quick last question because it's almost top of the hour. So the the rent the commune is gone. The land is still there. I know you haven't had a chance to go down there. You and I are going to go down there when you come back. Yes, to yes. Um, what, what's what's the property? What's it being, what's it being used for now? So right now it's a young life Christian youth camp, um, mm -hmm. which is really when you think about what it used to be and what it is now. Um, <laughs> there's some parallels. There's some differences. It's interesting, but. Um, yeah, it's kind of fascinating that that piece of land was always supposed to be agricultural. There were so many fights about the sannyasins turning it into a community for a lot of people to live there. Now, 
as a camp, a lot of people aren't living there. They're more temporarily there. But um, a lot of the buildings are still there. It's fascinating. If you look at the um, look at the kind of a Google map of the place, mm -hmm. so many of the buildings that the Sinyasins built in 1982, 83 are still there and still being used. They've been repurposed as sort of this very fancy resort facility for um, for kids to go to this camp. So including an airport where we landed many times going into cover yeah. cover stories, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. They still got the airstrip. And the shopping mall, I assume, is still there. Although I haven't been down there. It's a rather yeah. nice retail facility, good restaurants, a bunch yep. of Mall's ways you could there. spend money. The hotel is still there. Sheila's compound is still there. I mean, it's a lot of it's still there. It's interesting. So I think we're almost at the top of the hour here. Um, um, any other, I'm going to see if there are any other questions that we need to tackle before the, uh, I think, I think that's it here. Anything else you want to? Add before I close here. No, I just want to thank everyone who's listening for joining me. I really appreciate you just kind of hearing us chat about this. And thanks again to Powell's and to Walden. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, we've reached the top of the hour here, um, bringing conclusion to this great event. Um, yeah, I just want to thank everyone so much for joining us tonight. Uh, it was truly a pleasure to host Russell and Walden and welcome all of you here. Uh, please consider purchasing a copy of uh, Rajneesh Puram great cover here uh, by visiting pals.com. Uh, we've linked it in the chat for you as well. Um, I've also added a link uh, to our YouTube channel where this event will be posted in the next couple of days if you would like to rewatch or if you want to share with anyone who wasn't able to attend tonight. Uh, we look forward to seeing all of you at another one of our author events again soon. And until then, uh, take care and thank you all so much for being here tonight. Thanks, Russell. <laughs> thank you.